Hello, everyone, and welcome to part one of our four part speaker series titled Mapping a Monster, Making Sense of the COVID-19 Data Through Geospatial Technology. This is part one of four parts, and this part's titled The Big Impact. The program series is hosted by Johns Hopkins University AAP Geographic Information Program. My name is Dr. Cassandra Hansen, and I'm the program coordinator for the GIS and environmental science programs. We offer an online master's program as well as a GIS certificate, and I've provided the link about the program below. Before I get started, I wanted to give you a little bit of background of why we organized the speaker series. The reason why we organized the speaker series is we wanted to bring together professionals in the GIS industry who are using geospatial technology analysis and visual visualization to support a variety of pandemic web maps, graphs, applications that are used to raise awareness, inform the public from public decision makings, to guide policies, decisions on a global scale. Our overall goal of this series is to highlight cutting edge geospatial practices um, used in different fields, but more importantly, epidemiology, and the use of these applications on the global scale. So welcome again to the series. Um, and I'm gonna take a moment because we have a broad audience to talk a little bit about GIS and understand the components. So when we talk about GIS, we're talking about the geographic information systems made up of maps, analysis, data, and, and an output of applications. So providing a solid data collection in a simple map or app representing what is known is the overall goal of any GIS professional through the use of data collection, analysis, map creation, and apps. Here, GIS has been leveraged as a powerful data visualization and analysis tool for making decisions based on science and facts and have real world consequences. Geos geospatial technology plays a critical role in understanding and combining the virus threat by supporting a variety of pandemic maps and apps and graphs and applications used to raise awareness and inform the public and help in making these decisions. This, this use of geospatial technology to communicate a complicated topic has, been a, has had a huge global impact. From its humble beginnings, the dashboard has become one of the most authoritative sources for the latest coronavirus numbers and trends. Often described as the lifeboat, the COVID-19 interactive dashboard um, has provided solid data collection in a simple map application representing what is known. This early dashboard filled an information vacuum providing the most up-to-date comprehensive pictures of the virus on a global scale and, and the spread. And honestly, I don't know about you, but since late January, I have literally been dreaming of red graduated point symbols and checking the dashboard 100 times a day, always hitting refresh, looking at the latest and greatest. So for this part one series, I am pleased to bring um, two very important presenters that have been making a big pack, impact on geospatial technology in the community. So our first presenter will be Dr. Garrity from Esri, and our second will be Enching Dong, Johns Hopkins' very own PhD candidate. The second half of this presentation will not be recorded due to pending publication and research in progress. At this point in time, I would like to introduce Dr. Garrity. Dr. Garrity is the Chief Medical Officer and Health Solutions Director at Esri. She supports decision-making in the health and human service sectors using GIS. So I will go ahead and turn over the presentation powers to Dr. Garrity. Dr. Garrity, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, I appreciate it, I'm excited. Uh, well, hello, everybody. I have to say it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you today and share the lens through which I've been evaluating and assisting in this pandemic, and that is the geographic lens. By the end of my presentation, I hope that you'll agree with one of our taglines, which is that this technology can really help you to see what others can't. And in our world today, perhaps you've noticed, since you're all here, uh, that GIS and mapping have really never been more important. Geography is the science of our world. It provides all of the rich content. There's the 
biological content and the ecological content, sociological content, I mean, all of the ologies, right? As well as it gives us a common reference system, which is very close to human experience. And it really helps us to see complexity and uh, relationships and patterns. And this is one of the reasons why people seem to love maps. And this science really brings it all together in what I think is a really remarkable way um, because it helps us to understand at a deeper level and it helps us to intelligently respond. So today I want uh, you to focus on how GIS is actually an enterprise system for pandemic response and recovery. It's being used broadly from health responders like the World Health Organization to university researchers to disaster agencies like FEMA and the US military and hundreds if not thousands of local governments like St. John's County, Florida are taking advantage of the tools so that they can support their populations in a very holistic way. Now GIS provides a framework and a process. And this framework and process uh, is used for almost any kind of application that people really need to perform. I think of it as very much like a workflow. So we know it begins always with data and measurement, which we then want to be able to visualize and analyze to gain our deeper understanding. And that brings us to these important uh, active stages of planning, decision making, and taking action. Now, in the unique case of COVID-19, uh, these are some more specific information products and data sets that might be used in this workflow model. So we measure things like healthcare facilities and cases. We measure demographics and vulnerable populations. We communicate with strong mapping and dashboards. When we get to analytics, we're looking at things like forecasting and understanding the impacts. We do intervention planning like social distancing to stop the spread of the virus. And then we do testing and treatment, focusing on site selection and choosing the right locations to put all of these resources. And GIS also helps us to allocate where we put equipment or our personnel based on the current needs or what we're uh, anticipating as forecasted needs. Finally, it is a collection of tools that help us engage with our communities, and it is most certainly uh, data-driven and science-based. So many people ask, where, where do you start with applying GIS to pandemic response? Well, in answer to that question, I developed this five-step framework for understanding the impacts of COVID-19. And I would say that just about anything that you would want to do with GIS for pandemic response can fit into one of these areas. So they are map the cases, map the spread, identify and understand the vulnerable populations, map the capacity of your system to be able to respond and communicate with maps. So let's look at how to operationalize these steps. So when I talk about mapping the cases, I'm talking about the confirmed and the active cases, the fatalities and the recovered cases to get that overview that you'll need to understand the current situation in your locale. So for that overall situational awareness, no one dashboard has been relied upon more heavily than the Johns Hopkins University dashboard. And I remember the day after it went public, um, our team saw it tweeted on social media and a group of us uh, at Esri and Health were so impressed by its clarity of message. It's really well done. And then within another day, we could see that it was going viral. And uh, I'll tell you that at its peak, it uh, has been requested at a rate of a thousand times per second, um, leaving no question in my mind that people are hungry for geographic information. I'll also say that it is my personal belief that this mapped uh, based dashboard has changed the world. I think it's inspired, I know it's inspired hundreds of others to create their own COVID-19 dashboards. And it really increased, I think, the world's expectation to be able to consume real time or near real time information. And I'm frankly very excited that we get to hear more details about the creation of the dashboard uh, from Frank in the next presentation. 
But for now, we'll move on to step number two, which is to map the spread of disease. Now you all know probably that epidemiologists often look at the number of cases per day to see the outbreaks distribution over time. And so what I'm saying when I suggest we should map the spread uh, takes that to kind of the next level and it adds the geographic spread as well. Because I will say that when you know the direction of spread and the pace of disease spread, you can start to determine things like when and where to target your interventions, things like shelter in place instructions. Now this example that you're seeing on screen comes from the University of Virginia's Biocomplexity Institute. And you can see their day-to-day -day time slider across the top, the number of new cases per day in the graphic on the left, and the mapped cases over time in the mapped area. Now step three is about mapping vulnerable or higher risk populations. Now some folks may be at higher risk of severe disease. That would be groups we know of like older adults, those who have uh, chronic medical problems. Now some may be at higher risk for transmitting disease, like those who live in high density populations. Uh, these and other relevant factors, as you well know, are distributed differently across our communities. So I wanted to show you some examples of step three in Kansas City, Missouri. Now this first map is showing where there are high numbers and high percentages of seniors across the community. And here we're looking at the population density where the lighter the color, the higher density uh, in the area. And thus you have more likely interactions among the residents. The US CDC has made their social vulnerability index available so that we can look at this single index that provides 15 different measures of social vulnerability and find the areas of highest concern, which are shown here in the darkest blue. And in this last uh, example, we can see the red areas where there's a greater proportion of the population that is lacking health insurance. Now, as we move to step four with mapping capacity, we can get very analytical here. And I'm showing you the COVID-19 hospital impact model for epidemics, a mouthful, uh, otherwise known as the CHIME model from the University of Pennsylvania. Now, this is one of several models that are out there that can help jurisdictions or health systems figure out uh, if and when their capacity may be exceeded in terms of hospital beds, ICU beds, or ventilators. So what you're seeing here is the result of some scenario planning. We're comparing the impact of social distancing on surge capacity for ventilators, um, and improved social distancing is shown with the yellow curve. Uh, and in this case, hospitals would be able to manage ventilator needs better than with lax social distancing, which is shown in the orange color. And of course, the maps are showing us the places where those needs would be the greatest across, in this case, the state of Florida. Now, the fifth basic step that I wanted to share in that initial framework for recovery is communicating with maps. And lots and lots of people are doing this. Uh, Valley County, Idaho and Leon County, Florida, for example, are both thinking about businesses and how they're impacted and how they may have adjusted their business models so they can be more resilient in this difficult time. And other jurisdictions are providing public information about school closings and event cancellations. But you probably realize that as uh, different places are reopening, this might be showing some of the opposite information like which schools are reopened and when and which events have been rescheduled. And in the lower right hand corner, you can see the state of Maryland is sharing uh, case and testing data by zip code. Here the state of Alabama has implemented a testing site locator uh, so that people can find their nearest testing center. And early on in this crisis, the state of Oklahoma shared nationwide airport impacts to bring awareness to travelers across the country. Well, lots of people actually followed my advice for the five steps. I was excited about that, but then people started asking, okay, what, what should we do next? Especially as we start reopening the economy and people go back to their workplaces or they start to participate in 
some of the social and cultural activities of daily living. So in response, I gave this some thought and I created the five spatial approaches to safely reopening. And I actually thought about those fir first five steps that I just showed you as being pretty sequential in nature, but these five approaches can actually be done uh, almost in parallel and many of them need to be performed and reviewed iteratively uh, if we're gonna be successful. And so the five approaches are mapping the trends, maps for community resilience, mapping for organizational resilience, mapping the impacts, and still communicating with maps. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes focusing on these approaches uh, so that you can see what I mean by them. So mapping the trends is about consistently reviewing up-to-date uh, time-enabled maps that show the overall case trends. This one that you're seeing here shows trends for the most recent 14 days which is the CDC recommendation for being able to make decisions about whether a place is ready to reopen. I also uh, personally recommend getting a more holistic view than the last 14 days uh, with that localized epi curve. Um, the one that you're seeing here was created with ArcGIS Insights. Now mapping for community resilience is quite a big category. Um, resilient communities may use mapping and analysis to improve their overall surveillance activities with tools like space-time cubes. Um, and their surveillance activities most certainly are going to also include contact tracing. Well, we're adding to the contact tracing story by suggesting that community spread of an outbreak requires adding the spatial component so that you don't uh, only focus on discerning the linkages between cases and contacts, but you can also understand the places they visited, which will likely illuminate some risks that might have otherwise been invisible. In a similar way to mapping vulnerabilities, I think that understanding social equity is a key part of community resilience. Current protests across the country and even internationally prove the point. We need to constantly keep an eye on who's at risk and why so that steps can be taken to mitigate that risk to improve overall social equity. Um, it's clear that disasters of all kinds tend to magnify disparities in our communities. We need to address that. Our communities may need to provide additional resources during tough times like food availability and assistance or drive-through testing centers. But even beyond that, I think that this pandemic will essentially change the way that we do some things. And GIS can help, like in election planning, uh, managing homeless populations, and exercising new safety precautions in larger public events. We actually have uh, some solutions coming out on that last topic very soon. Now, there are several reasons that you may want to establish uh, new or augmented resources to respond to COVID-19. So I wanted to just take a minute to show you how location allocation modeling fits in here. So as I said, you may be wanting to determine the optimal locations for testing sites, which would need to have good access for um, high throughput situations, maybe drive-through testing or pedestrian walk-up capabilities. Um, and then also, if hospitals are overwhelmed, you might be looking to site alternative care locations that would need to have certain criteria like providing overnight care, being separate but from hospitals, but still having access to medical personnel, and they would need to be suitably equipped for this disease. You might also be wanting to find the best locations for food or resource distribution sites. And I think those might be kind of like testing sites where they would have to be high throughput, drive-through, uh, pedestrian walk-up types of locations. So the first step in the location allocation model is to determine the population demand for the new resources. Um, you might think of demand as need or risk in this case. So the idea here is to create a risk surface for each of these risk types. So a community may have people uh, at increased transmission risk, socioeconomic risk, uh, increased susceptibility to the disease risk, 
uh, exposure risk and resource insufficiency risk. In the end, you'll be able to provide a risk ranking over small geographies like block groups or neighborhoods. Now, I want you to notice that I have added a link to a specific lesson on how to do this risk surface work. Um, and you can follow that link to get step-by-step -step instructions so you could create your own risk surfaces. And I will provide my slides to the organizers uh, so this can be shared. Now, here is a county level example for the state of Georgia where we've used spatial grouping to combine the five different risk surfaces that I showed you. And then we can prioritize areas that have the highest population demand, or like I said, need for services. So when you have that information, uh, you move on to the second part, which is to calculate the optimal locations for those new services. Now you will need access to road network data uh, so that's one input to the model. Another input is the risk surfaces that we just created. Uh, then you also want to add what I would call supply chain capacity constraints uh, that you might have. Those constraints might be uh, the ability to staff a certain number of facilities or administer tests. Uh, maybe you have a budget for only 10 facilities. You can constrain the model to only select the top 10 optimal sites from the entire population of candidate uh, sites that you make available uh, to the program. Or you could just choose all of the sites that meet your predefined criteria um, and your population need with no additional constraints. But basically what the model does is it weights travel distance from the highest demand neighborhoods uh, to select your best sites for these uh, different centers and new resources. But I don't think the value of adding location ends there, right? Once those decisions have been made to move forward with the chosen sites, additional map-based applications can be used to track your progress in, uh, have you stood up the sites? Are you monitoring each site's ability to meet that ongoing population need? Okay, so now I'm ready to move to approach number three, which is mapping for organizational resilience. Now, businesses of all kinds have been particularly hard hit by COVID-19. I mean, they need to see the status of multiple facilities at a glance and manage the impacts to each one of them. Businesses are gonna need to keep track of a distributed workforce nowadays, and they still have employees in the field. They'll want to ensure the strength of their own supply chain and customer markets and prioritize employee safety and wellness. They also need to be able to communicate with the public as their status evolves through the crisis. And resilient organizations use mapping to manage their indoor spaces for physical distancing uh, and office setup as well. And they can even perform indoor and outdoor location tracking across their campus to help identify where and who people were uh, in contact. Um, should a new infection arise. And those kinds of activities can really nicely support the public health contact tracing initiatives. The fourth approach on the reopening is to map the impacts. And this is where leaders will wanna better understand the economic upswings and the downturns, uh, monitoring things like economic vulnerability, unemployment rates, and vulnerable businesses. And they need to compare that information side by side with the health impacts. Again, going back to monitoring the trends, looking at the hospital capacity information. Uh, I think if we're gonna be successful in managing infections until we have a vaccine, then these two forces of health and economy need to be kept uh, in some level of balance. And again, we still need to continually communicate with MAPS. As I said, map-based dashboards have changed the world, thanks in large part to the famous Johns Hopkins dashboard that you're gonna learn about next. But also there's increasing need for collaborational, collaboration and bi-directional communication. And we've seen that ArcGIS Hub can serve that need very well. In fact, I wanted to share with you that all of the information, the tools, hundreds of data resources and detailed guidance that I've discussed today, and actually much, much more is freely available 
through Esri's COVID-19 GIS Hub. So please take a screenshot of this URL, uh, check back often because we are adding to it every day. So I hope that you agree that when it comes to pandemic response uh, and reopening leading toward recovery, we hope a geographic approach can help you to see what others can't. But it's not just about technology. You need leadership champions to manage efforts against the mission and create a really clear strategy. You need strong governance procedures for things like data sharing and transparency. And of course, you need the people who know how to use the system, like all of our GIS professionals. So I did want to mention that uh, I have produced a white paper on using GIS for pandemic response. We're gonna make that available to you after the webinar in a follow-up email, as well as a series of uh, short videos uh, that are educational and will show you how to create uh, a dashboard like what you're gonna see next. Um, so I will end by thanking Cassie and Johns Hopkins University for the opportunity to share this information with you today. I do really wish you all well, and I invite you to contact me if I can be of service to you in your efforts with GIS. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Gary. That was wonderful, um, wonderful presentation. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so we'd like to open up the, um, the community of folks that are attending to um, ask questions uh, specifically to Dr. Garrity about her presentation um, and we can monitor those questions as they're coming in. Uh, again, thank you so much for being a part of the speaker series, very informative. Um, I think one thing that you really touched on um, is that you know a global pandemic such as this, it really does magnify disparities and we see that all the time with natural disasters and just disasters on a global scale. Um, also, on the positive note, you know, we're really seeing the use of, of just some fascinating technology for identifying where people are going, where they've been in that trace contact. And, and there's so much spatial components that you know, we're still applying and learning about. Um, so again, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Sure. Um, I will say, Cassie, that um, you mentioned the social equity again, and I wanna let everybody know if they go to the Hub site, You'll find uh, it looks like a card under the getting data section where we've put together over 130 data sets to support research on social equity. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you for sharing. A question that um, just came in uh, with was in regard to data sets and sources. Um, are these data sets and sources all avail available at the GeoHub that you mentioned? For the COVID yes, so I would definitely start with the hub first for anything related to COVID-19 that you can think of. Um, and there are many, many more ways to get data, but my next favorite um, place would be for you to take a look at the Living Atlas of the World, um, where you'll find another several thousand mm -hmm. data sets that you can use for all sorts of topics. Excellent. And the resources that Dr. Garrity has mentioned throughout this presentation, we will go ahead and send them to everyone who's attending so that you'll have those URLs in hand. Um, let's see, some more questions coming in. Um, so again, some more data questions. Question coming in about um, data quality for the data use um, overall. Uh, you know, how's, how is data quality being adhered when it's, it's provided in the Living Atlas? Like what are some of the criteria that as we looks at? That's a great question because we only allow things to go into the Living Atlas that have been vetted um, by our team of demographers. Um, so properly curated, vetted, and they have proper metadata. Uh, so you'll be able to look at the metadata for any of those data sets and see uh, exactly what they were intended for, how they were collected, um, all of that information that will let anybody decide whether it's appropriate for their use or not. Excellent. Thank you. And so a lot of great questions coming in about gaining access to the resources, gaining access to um, how to make a dashboard, and we'll go ahead and provide all those resources to everyone um, at the end of this presentation. Um, but I would like to also take a moment and um, identify the second part of our speaker series that will take place on June 17th. The title of this speaker series is called The Big Decision. Um, so we have speakers 
that will be talking about how the data was used to make big decisions um, from the federal government standpoint um, to the more historical and um, display of pandemic data from National Geographic. So we'll have speakers from National Geographic as well as from the National Alliance for Public Safety, GIS. So if you haven't reg registered already, please go ahead and do so. It's a separate registration process. I have also provided um, the department's email for any questions about the online master's or certificate program. I've also provided uh, my email address if there's any additional questions. Um, all the resources that we, we spoke about for this presentation, um, we'll be able to send out um, those available resources after the presentation is done today. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending and for presenters today. That was fantastic. Um, and I will hope to see you on June 17th. Thank you guys.